All right, welcome to the Media Mindset. Today we're joined by a very special guest, someone I've gotten to know a bit over the past few months, Matt Kerr, who's an actor, voiceover artist, athlete, producer. The list goes on and on. If I'm missing anything, you'll have to correct me on that, Max. Dork. Dork. Nerd. (laughs) (laughs) Comic book aficionado, you name it. Um, So, Mac, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind uh, giving the the listeners and viewers uh, at home a little bit of background on your career thus far and how you got to where you are today. All right. uh, First, thanks for having me here. It's a fantastic area, fantastic. I mean, crew, I'm already impressed. Um, me, I guess in a nutshell, without rambling off track, uh, came to New York about 10 years ago, came originally to be a voiceover actor. Then once I got on camera, it just kind of took off from there and doing some extra work and everything and blasted into stunts into the first year and got hitched on that. And then kind of branched off into doing all these different things and keeping a bunch of irons in the fire. So currently where I'm at is on camera, kind of stunt actor doing a little voiceover here and there, and just kind of flying by with what I've got. And it's just been a great ride from television to film, and it just keeps getting better and better every year. It really does. Excellent. What are some, um, some for folks at home, some projects where uh, folks might be able to have you know, seen some of your past work? I guess the, the ones that really make my just hair and arms stand up that are fun ones because I'm such a nerd, as I said, is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Fantastic, spending three months getting your butt kicked by Ninja Turtles, you know. I mean, turtle power beating you up. It's a, it's a kid's dream come true. Yeah, you got to love it. You got to love it. Um, certainly John Wick, the very first John Wick when it came out in 2014. We didn't even know what the project was. And because I was on Ninja Turtles, the second AD was the second AD for John Wick. And they're like, we've got the guy, you know. And I just was... The availability was there, and I said yes, and went through all the interview process, and then that came to fruition. So a lot of great things happened there, a lot of stunts happening with the Marvel series that's unfortunately now canceled with Punisher and Jessica Jones. So I was lucky enough to get involved with a lot of the great stunt groups and stunt coordinators with those series. Law and Order, got my ribs broken on Law and Order. Fantastic season. Ribs broken for real, actually. For real, and they actually used the take. Oh, in wow. the uh, season finale. Well, they have to then. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, we're trying to recreate it in ADR. They're like, try to remember what it was like. And I was like, I don't want to remember what it was <laughs> like. <laughs> it hurt, but it looked good on camera. But the Madam Secretary, a lot of these, you know, cop shows, espionage and government and everything, and just having a lot of fun with the action pieces in those. So bouncing around New York and just trying to keep my, keep hot on the radar. What, how did you get fall into stuntman work? It seems very casual in your description, but you know, like, well, then I started doing stunts, obviously. Yeah, you know, stunts, like, stunts is a tribe, Kenny. Yeah. It's really a tribe. You got to really be, it gets into trust issues because stunts doesn't work like on camera acting. It's, there's no agents, there's no managers, there's no middleman. You're your own private contractor. So you hustle sets, meaning you go and you talk to stunt coordinators and say, you know, kind of present yourself, your headshot, that kind of thing. You might get a call next day. You might get a call next year, but it just depends on, you know, who you worked with and then your name kind of gets bigger. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it's just, I guess to answer your question is, do you come in with a skill set? It's important to come in with a skill set. So I came in with, you know, fighting and combat and weapons and things like that, and then the skill set grew. So how I fell into it, you know, it's always, you know, how do you fall into it? I was on Dark Knight Rises mm-hmm. as just a little mercenary, you know, bad guy, and somebody got fired and they're like, can anybody operate this weapon? And it was an HK G36 submachine gun. I just kind of raised my hand as a little non-union kind of guy. And before you know it, bam, I was in the shot. I made the trailer and I was like, I can get used to this. (laughs) I started working on more stuff and then more opportunities kind of landed on my plate. Mm -hmm. And uh, just doing more and more as much as I can. Yeah, very cool. So where did you develop that skill set? It's just that, are you a hobbyist or just kind of yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I'm not a merc or anything like that. I'm no James <laughs> Bond or anything, but it was just really getting into it. I was always kind of like an action guy. So you're saying like, and always being an athlete, we're always moving around. So I always wanted to get into that stuff. And I love the movies. I was a nerd, you know, I was in the Schwarzenegger age, the Jean-Claude Van Damme and the Stallones and, and those kind of movies. So, you know, I kind of developed that skill set early. And then, of course, I had to polish it a lot more because when you get into film and television, it has to be, you know, you, of course you have your tactical advisors and things like that. But yeah, that's kind of where it started from and that's where it had to grow. So I had, you know, continuing education and learning to get better and better. I'm, I'm very curious. By the way, I want to say if, if that's a great front, I think that's actually the, 
plot of uh, Jean Claude Van Johnson on Amazon is that he he does he does stunts, but he is actually a secret agent, yeah. and his whole front is being an actor. So yeah. I'm not convinced you aren't a secret agent at this point. <laughs> um, but you know, your career's taken some really interesting twists and, and, and turns, and with each of those, it sounds like how you present yourself, whether it's to casting directors, producers, stunt coordinators, it always has to evolve a little bit based on what those roles are. So how has that influenced kind of how you present yourself, your self your self branding, um, you know, and how people are seeing Matt Kerr? Well, certainly with different casting rooms, like I say, in stunts, if you go into a stunt audition, you have to you're not gonna be dressed in a suit. Obviously, you're going to have to go in there and be ready to move and be able to perform. If you go into an on-camera casting or like a modeling casting, you know, it's just like one's going to be a go-see, you take some pictures and you're gone. One, you have to know the lines. You have to be prepared for more dialogue and text and being and working with another actor, you know, that kind of thing. And then you go into VO. You can you get into the booth, you know, get ready for projecting the voice and cleaning it up for the enunciation and pronunciations and be able to stay clean in the dialogue. So it's just this roller coaster of, you know, you got to unlock one and lock, lock one up and unlock the other one and get ready to you know just kind of like shift gears. It's like if I go in with a stunt mentality into a VO, I'm kind of like I'm adrenaline and jacked up, but no, I got to downshift and move up. So it's different, different kind of plays, and you just got to kind of work with those different gears that you have, and hopefully you've got them ready by the time you walk in the door. Um, you've been on a lot of a lot of sets, both TV and movies, over the past decade. He said it's been about 10 years since you lived in New York. And a lot has changed technologically. The advent of, of social media is really a, a driving force for how people stay connected. What are some ways you've seen that, if it has, translated to how content is filmed, produced these days at that level? Well, certainly there's a lot of, when it comes to anything like Marvel or anything that's going to be really high, you know, box office grossing, put your phone away, you know, you're going to get fired right off the set. If you peep about anything that you just shot, it's just like, you know, forget it. You know, you got to keep it quiet. And certainly it's going to be great for, you know, marketing the movie or TV series or whatever later on. But for that point, it's just like, just let production take care of it. Let production take care of it. And then you just do your job and then go. So it's like social media has an influence on it, but just let them do their thing. Let publicity, let marketing, let production do your thing. Go in as the actor, go in as a stunt, go in and do your part and then leave, that kind of thing. I know you want to get engaged with it and stuff like that, but, you know, A-listers like Chris Pratt, you know, doing that big video after Avengers Endgame, you know, he can get away with that kind of thing. If I were to pull that off, I'm like, Mac, it was great. See you later. You know, you're done. <laughs> he, he had to be very confident he was oh going to get God. rehired. Yeah, of course, the out. movie was out at that point. It was just like, whoa, are you kidding me? So, you know, they're releasing all these little videos and everything, and it's great to see the behind the scenes. I think that really shows a lot. I'm mean, using Endgame as an example. Was, hopefully, I'm not spoiling anything. I'm trying not to say anything about it. But certainly, it kind of gives that back, you know, be backstage, behind the scenes kind of thing, and it kind of gives everybody an idea of, you know, maybe some... You know, the reality behind film and television, that kind of thing. And a lot of people just don't see it and they don't realize it. And they're just like glitz and glam and, you know, smoke and mirrors, that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's long hours. It's a lot of work. And, you know, we get hurt. Like I said, broken bones, broken hands, broken arms, stunts. You know, it's just long time away from family, away from friends, stuff like that. So I think social media kind of plays into it to show the reality of what film and television can be. You know, it can be a little more tiresome. It's like, yeah, it's fun to watch it. But it's just like, boy, you know what, boy, it takes a lot to do all that stuff. Take after take after take. Maybe you're spitting real blood like I was on The Punisher. I was like, hey, it's going to look great on camera. Let's keep doing it. <laughs> so realistic. Oh, good times. Good times. So in terms of uh, these unspoken or spoken rules, like, are you receiving guidance from the, the people working on, on the set? Like how you should engage with social media? Are they prompting you or is it more... Usually you know, in written people form. People are supposed to... Yeah, yeah can very they, they put it in written form before yeah. you... Or when you're getting... Uh, usually when you go in the audition, you can't talk about the script that you're reading. Say so you book the job and then, of course, it's in your contract. You, were, you sign your name and you're like... Keep your mouth shut, right. you know, that kind of stuff. And if you want to get booked again. So, yeah, they're really strict when it comes to those kind of things. If it's going to be like a high-profile project. I mean, if we're doing like a short film, we're trying to go in the short film circuit, that kind of thing, then, you know, you can really promote and kind of throw those things out there. But if it's going to be a high-profile project with big, big investors and production companies, then you just got to kind of yeah, keep yeah. it at bay and keep it in the vault. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, Which is smart. <laughs> Let it out. 
Yeah, one of the first things uh, we talked about when we, when we last caught up was we were, we were talking about social media presences. It was actually right before we launched the Media Mindset. And it's something that we actually talked about last week. We had a friend of mine who's a Broadway actor on, and he was talking about how casting directors, even before they look at your reel these days, they're looking at your social media profiles. Yeah. They want you to have that imprint. They want to kind of get a sense of who you are holistically. Yeah. Is that something that, that you've experienced and seen evolve? I mean, if I do a little bit of commercial modeling, they'll always ask me, you know, right when you get there, it's like, oh, are we allowed to use your social media? Can we post something on social media? Are you okay with that? And you answer the question. But as for on camera, I don't really get a lot of it. As for stunts, you know, not really so much, but yeah, maybe it's going off track of your question, but does it play into like casting and the process? I want to say it does, and unfortunately, you know, social media can be a little bit of that smoke and mirrors. She's like, you know, there's availability to be able to buy followers and that kind of stuff and to be able to put up your best and that kind of thing. But it's also putting you out there as a digital signature saying like, hey, here's me, here's Mac, you know, this kind of stuff. And putting it out there instead of maybe a website. And it shows the enthusiasm from followers, which of course, are they real, are they not? Are they bots? Is it an algorithm? You know, that kind of thing. So, you know, there could be mis mixed feelings from person to person, actor to actor of, you know, what does social media do? How is it an influence? But I know I've been to a couple panels where it's directors and that question was asked. It's like, does that influence your decision when it comes to casting a director? And every one of them on the, on the panel were like, no. If they can't act, I don't care what their social media says. I don't care. I wanna see what they can do in front of me, right then, right now, can I see that chemistry? Can I see something come off the pages? So, you know, it's a scale. It goes up and down. But how I feel about it, it's cumbersome. <laughs> it's like, I don't sit there and post, like, I'm going to the bathroom. It's like, we're in Dumbo. It's like, do I post something about the bridge? I was like, no. I, was like, I put it back in. I was like, I'm not going to be that guy. If it's going to be something really, really striking that I think the fans are really going to enjoy, then, you know, I'm going to throw it out there. Mm -hmm. But do they need to know that I had a banana before I got here? No. Or I had some yogurt. You know, it was, it was great yogurt, but do you need to know about it? No. Well, we do now. You so, do now. now know. You <laughs> saved it for the podcast. I was saving it for the podcast, yeah. exactly. It's I was like, I wanted right more practice. exposure. I wanted a bigger platform. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Is, how is it interacting with the others on set, the other stunts, the other actors? Um, you know, in normal life, everyone tags each other and does all this. Like... How do I'm sure people are thinking about their image, you know, perhaps even more um, on their social media profiles, on their public profiles um, as a public person. So it's like, is it like normal interaction or is it? It's 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 pretty normal, I gotta say. It's a little different from acting to stunts. Mm. Stunts is it's the the men and women of action, and it's usually you know talking about past jobs, talking about injuries, talking about action, and uh, sometimes you know. You know, sparring off. You know, we're not just sitting in a in a trailer. You know, we start sparring off and fighting. You know, that kind of thing. It's like I was doing this move. I was doing this move. You go into the world of acting. It's uh, I think it's it kind of depends on who you're working with. You know, how green are they? How much experience do they have? And uh, it's just like, do they want to have that kind of presence? And if it if it is somebody that's just doing you know the selfie stick with their arm constantly, I kind of gravitate away from that. Mm -hmm. It's just like, that just says a lot to where it's just, they're social media dominant and I'm, that's just not my thing. And it's something where I've I really kind of, I've taken that as a positive from a couple of A-list directors that I'm fortunate to work with to where it's, you know, maybe it's just not as important. Maybe you work on your craft. Mm -hmm. You work on your relationships and I'm not talking about networking, I'm talking about your relationships with actors, mm -hmm. not what can you take from them, but what can you learn from them? Mm -hmm. You know, what can you really establish with working with such great talent? Mm -hmm. And then build your career that way and make yourself better. And that's where I think social media might be a little bit of a spike driven in sometimes. I don't know, but it's, you know, you get out of it what you put into it, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I've seen a lot of great actors that have a little bit of small following, but you know, they're big. Maybe it's just not a big focus for them or some of them don't even have any at all. So why create that anxiety on set to worry about, worry about your craft, right. worry about what you have to do that day, worry about the daily, worry about the stunt, worry about the action, not, whoa, how am I crafty? 
check me out, you know, that kind of thing. I think social media has a great presence and I think it's, it's something that is, it's really great for what's happening now in the digital age and where we are in 2019. Just sometimes it needs to be out of the way. Stunts, safety is number one. And if you're doing this, with, it's just like your, your head's not where it needs to be. Kenny, we have fight scene. Mm -hmm. Put your phone away. We need to be doing this now. We need to be locked in, dialed in. So again, I'm using that roller coaster kind of variance of sometimes yes, no, yes, no. There's time and place, I guess. It would be a short answer to your question as I answer it in length. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the in-depth. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned earlier a lot of this work comes from especially in the world of stunts, which is its own beast in many ways from what yeah. it sounds like. It comes from interpersonal connections. It comes from establishing yourself as a professional, performing well, and that might result in the next gig, that might result in the, result in the exactly. next job. So if you're glued to your phone when you should be present, you have that much less of a chance. And I can tell you a stunt coordinator's not gonna like that. Mm -hmm. They're just like, if that's what you, and stunt coordinators are, and action guys and women are just like, it's not about the vanity. I was, in, I was fortunate to be involved with a great stunt coordinator, stunt man, Stephen Keffer's short film, uh, Concrete and Crash Pads. He was talking about New York stunts, New, the, the life of New York stunt professionals. And there was a line that I said, and he's just been using it, and it's like, I said, the shadow warriors. That's what we are, the shadow warriors. We make the stars look great. You never see our face a lot of the time. If we're doubling or if we're the bad guy, or bad woman, we're just getting killed, wiped out, and recycled sometimes, things like that. So vanity cannot be part of that equation. So we're talking a little off camera, Mac. Let's talk, a, uh, and you had mentioned the difference between uh, stage combat training, so what an actor might do in, in a live show, yeah. versus um, you know what directors and stunt coordinators are looking for on screen. You mentioned the camera's constantly moving, so you're gonna have to sell those movements from a lot of a lot of different angles. So do you, do you see um, the skill set, that stage combat skill set, being different from what people are being asked to perform on screen? Exactly right, it has to be different. And those stunt coordinators are looking for those real combatants, opposed to the theater training. They're looking for guys, women, to be able to fight on camera. Because you have to be able to have that endurance to be able to perform the action. You have to be able to perform it with now, are you going to be able to sell the stunt? And again, like you're saying, the camera's going to move at different angles over and over and over. Can you show it? Can you take direction? Stunt coordinators are going to say, well, I don't like that throw. Can you throw it another way? Well, if you only learned it a certain way and say a class, that's not going to work. You're restricted to your skill set. But if you're a fighter of, say, 10 years, and you say you've been involved with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and ground and pound, you know about failures and successes. You know about what worked, what didn't work. Maybe you're in competition, you got your butt kicked, maybe you won, those kind of things. Are you a seasoned athlete in combat? And we're talking about specifically that transference of experience onto camera, experience transferred onto cinema and film. Can you sell it? An exaggerated haymaker to the head is gonna have to be, form, be performed so many different ways. Hey, we gotta cheat an angle this way. We have to cheat an angle this way. Stage, you have one plane, that is it. And you have what? maybe 45 degree angle of what the audience is going to see. They might do a 360 pan around on a fight scene. You have to be able to adjust, you have to be able to just change things up. And if you're an experienced fighter in the octagon, in the ring, or just in general, then you have to be able to adapt. And stunt coordinators are going to look for that constantly. And that goes for weapons, that goes for, maybe you're a gymnast, are you good at experience in falling? When it comes to police work, are you good at formations, tactical formations, soldiering. You say you were ex-military, can you? Do you know how to execute blading? These kind of things. So if you say you're this, they expect this. Tactical advisors are there to polish things up. This isn't so much on theater, but film and television to be able to sell a stunt because they have such a high budget, they have a high expectation. Maybe they want to renew from a pilot. Maybe they want to go on to a sequel after the movie. Maybe they have these expectations. That's why these advisors are on. That's why they try to hire the best. One, so people don't get hurt. And two, they can sell the hell out of that stunt and make it worthwhile. So if you get, that's why stunts is always gonna be involved with the union. And I wanna branch into that a little bit. It's just, stunts is always gonna stay union because one, the experience is there, the insurance is always gonna be there, the medical benefits are always gonna be there, but it ensures that we're bringing in professionals. You bring in non-union people that maybe they have the experience or maybe they don't, and then people get hurt. And that's how, you know, we had some deaths last year. 
and we have some people that really get hurt and everything. And that's unfortunate. And it's really sad that we have to lose people for the sake of entertainment, you know, but we know our job. It's dangerous. It's dangerous as hell. I've gotten hurt. I've broken bones. It happens. But we do it because we love it. But we do it with the knowledge, knowing that we're continuing our education. We're continuing our training. You can't just say, you know what? I'm going to go off and try to be a stunt person. I just try to help out anybody that's in stunts. I always try to help them because if somebody didn't help me, I wouldn't be where I'm at. But you have to go in, as we said earlier, a skill set. You have to have a skill set going into something as dangerous as stunt work is. On stage, yeah, you can get hurt on stage. But in film, you've got fire, you've got live rounds, you have somebody falling from a building, you have equipment that just could go wrong, set can fall apart, things that people get hurt. So it all comes together as some big cheese ball to make a successful picture, to make a successful series, to make a successful ensemble that, you know, hopefully will get nominated, you know, for awards and things like that. But, you know, that's not our focus. But that's just showing appreciation and recognition for what stunt men and women do. And it really is, like I said, I go back to that big thing, cheese ball, because you add on all these layers of training, expectation, trust, and it all comes together and you get great projects like that we all enjoy that goes on to be sequels and franchises. And I could be rambling on, but it really is, stunts is a very elaborate world, but a very, very tight knit tribe. And trust is such a large component of that. And when you have that, you put together great projects and great action that people love. And that's why we keep doing it. Whether we get hurt and we're spitting blood and breaking bones, people are like, why do you do it? What do you do for a living? You sit at a desk and was like, well, I'm having fun. I'm being a nerd and getting paid for it. So, you know, it's part of the job. It's part of the gig. And you got to love it. And we do. But there's just a lot that goes in behind it. And I think there's a lot more. Not to, and to finish up my point, I think it really is getting to the point where people are starting to really appreciate what stunt men and women do because the projects have become so much bigger. Right. And people, and I use Marvel as an example all the time because it's like, wow, did you see the action? Wow, did you see the stunts? wow, there's stunt people out there doing that kind of right. stuff. You know, it's not him or her doing it. It's stunt people behind there doing that stuff. You know, I wonder if they get hurt. We do. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy it. And we're really getting that recognition. And it's just, uh, it's evolved and it's becoming better and better. And stunts is becoming a bigger element in movies. And I'm loving it. Action movies are never going to go away. I just hope they keep getting better and better because that means more work for us. <laughs> <laughs> so rock on and cross your fingers. Um, well, those are that's pretty much the list of questions yeah. that, that I had. And uh, Mac, if people want to follow your work, follow you on social media, whether you know that's that's a whole kettle of fish in and of itself, as we talked about. But where can people kind of keep up with with what you're doing and, and what's next for you? Yeah, Instagram, just my name, Mac Kerr, M A C K K U H R. Throw a bunch of stuff on there when I can, and uh, I'm kind of known for Mac Mondays has been my thing. I don't know. If it started as a joke like a year ago where I beat up Mondays. <laughs> I find a meme and I put Mac and I put Monday, and it could be something as I don't know a, a raccoon beating up a, a cheese ball or something like that. I'm the raccoon and Monday is the cheese ball, so I'm having fun with that. But project-wise, I'm really excited for some things coming in 2020. The Western, it's something that's been scripted, was put in front of me about three years ago. It's a full-on Western I'm co-starring in with a beautiful Christine James Walker. We're shooting it out in New Mexico. It's written by Joe Pomerico. And it's just about love and revenge and action. I'm doing all my own stunts. And it's going to be shot on film. It's not going to be digital. It's going to be shot like the 1970s, kind of Clint Eastwood look to it. And... Uh, Right now, we've got about 80% funded, and we're hoping for the green light to go along with that. Chris Miscavige, he's actually here in, in uh, Brooklyn. Great comic book author of Thomas Alsop. He's at Comic-Con, San Diego, New York. Long story short, got the deal. He's writing the Grateful Dead comic uh, graphic novel, but he also wrote one called This Is Where We Fall. Long story short, they're like, we got to make a movie about this. Probably one of the most amazing scripts I have ever read in my life of feature film. And he's like, we're shooting it in 2020. I have a major character in that. I've known him for about nine years. He said the character's locked. It's, it's just a, it's a space sci-fi cowboy western revenge action movie. It's hard to grasp and put your mind around it, but it is ridiculous. And right now, Hugh Jackman's reading for the lead. And it's just like, I... 
let's go. <laughs> Giddy up. <laughs> Giddy up. So I'm hoping that happens the way we want it to. So 2020 has got a lot of great things coming at me. So excited. Cross your fingers, man. It's going to be fun. Fantastic. Well, Mac, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Very much appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Definitely. Great time. Great talking to you.